praise team is rocking it so much this morning that they're bringing the house down. Did y'all see the pieces of paint falling from the ceiling? Now they're raising the roof this morning. We, can, we know how to worship here, I tell you what. Uh, it's good to be here today. Hope you guys have had a great morning. I was sitting back there watching our live stream a little bit and watching people join in who... Some are traveling. Uh, someone was at, you know, at the nursing home with their mother, and one of my uh, pastor friends from Honduras was watching. So uh, it's just neat to see people from all over the, the world kind of tuning in to see what's going on here. And that's, um, that's one of the, the great things about the Internet and how that works. And uh, it's just a blessing that we're able to take what we do here and share it with this community and, and around the world. This morning I'm going to be talking about what we need. And if you, that's kind of the title of the message and uh, what we need. Um, It's interesting when we talk about physical fitness, when we talk about getting in shape, I'm going to speak for a lot of people, and this is the way our minds typically work. When we start talking about getting in shape, we think, what do I need? Okay, we start thinking, I need a gym membership, okay, or I need a new pair of running shoes, or I need a fitness tracker. If I had a fitness tracker that will count my steps, I'll get in shape, all right? And, and so we say, oh, I need a, a diet plan, or I need, are, are, you, are, are you tracking with me? Are, do, do any of y'all do this? We start thinking about, okay, if I want to get in shape physically, then I need to purchase something. I need to do something. I need something so that I can get in shape. And I think that's how our minds work. We're kind of that consumeristic at times, and and we think if only we could buy something, then we could get in shape. But the reality is, right, we could buy all of that stuff and still be just as out of shape as before. Why? Because it's not what you buy, it's kind of what you do. Now, you can buy the coolest running shoes, but if they sit in your closet, you will not lose weight. You can, you can subscribe and, to Weight Watchers or whatever diet plan, but if you never go to the meetings, if you don't follow the plan, it doesn't matter how much money you pay, you will not get healthy and lose weight. And so now let me ask you, kind of that same train of thought, what do you need to grow in your faith? What do you need? We do the same thing when it comes to spiritual matters. We say, man, if I just bought a new Bible, did you see that new Bible? That is so cool. Did you see all the study notes and the pictures in it? Um, oh, that, that would do it. Or, or, or I need a new devotional book. I need something to read each morning. Or I need a different Bible study. Or I, mean, I just need to go to this new course or this new evangelism strategy. I need to learn some, And we do the same thing spiritually that we often do physically. When we think we need something, we want to buy something to fix a problem. And I want to talk this morning um, about what Jesus did. So what does Jesus do when the disciples need to learn about how to serve others? Does he buy them like a new tool belt with instructions on how to build things for people in need? Does he pull out the scrolls and say, okay, this is what you need to know? Does he start a new Bible study? No. Instead of just telling them, he showed them. And, and this, is, this is radical for even us this morning. This is, this is kind of a stepping on our toes, get our attention kind of message. Because instead of learning about something, instead of buying something to fix the problem, sometimes we just need to model what this looks like. And so this morning, we're going to continue going through uh, this study in the book of John. We've been, we've been focusing on these statements that, um, amen, amen, or in some translations, verily, verily, or truly, truly. It's these statements that Jesus kind of stops us and says, listen up. This is important, so you need to hear what I'm about to say. And he is speaking as one with authority, and he wants our attention. Um, Today we begin in the upper room. We'll be in John 13, so if you've got your Bibles, flip there. Some of Jesus' most significant words were said in this chamber when he was alone with his disciples. This particular episode 
of Jesus washing the disciples' feet, it really convicts me of my need to serve others, even in the most lowly tasks that sometimes we think are beneath us. And so let's see what we can learn from Jesus this morning. I want to jump right in. If you're taking notes, uh, you can follow along uh, in your worship guide there. The first point this morning is we need Christ-like compassion. If we want to learn from Jesus, we need the type of compassion that Jesus had. John 13, verse 1 through 5. It says, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. I, I like some translations say that he showed them the full extent of his love. I saw a quote from First Baptist this week. It said, compassion is not what I feel, but what I do. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. Verse 2 kind of gives us a little of the background. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, he rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. And then he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. So the first point this morning, we need to develop a Christ-like compassion. It was the custom in Jesus' day for someone to perform uh, the routine of washing feet. Someone should have volunteered. Right. And when they ate back then, they reclined at a table and the person next to you had his feet at your elbow just about in your face. So your neighbor's feet would be very visible. And let's just be honest, right? They would kind of be a little bit nasty from walking around in the, in, in the dust and the dirt. And they wore sandals. And so they're reclining. Their feet are right in your face. Now, the last few weeks, I've got to be honest, I watch a lot of the NBA basketball playoffs, and now the finals. I'm, a, I'm pulling for Golden State. I'm a, I'm a Steph fan. Uh, and, I, I mean, I've been enjoying watching that. But I was watching one of the games, and I was just got, like, really grossed out. Okay, I'm just going to be honest. Um, Shaquille O'Neal, y'all know who he is, big seven-foot guy. He's a commentator now. Uh, he pulled off his shoe and stuck his foot up for the camera. And they showed a close-up of his foot. I want to just show it to you this morning. Size 22 shoe size. Okay? I'm just going to leave that up. You can't, get that, you can't get that out of your mind. Just be glad it's first service and not second service. you got some time to recover before lunch. Okay? Oh, man, you took it off. Okay. Look at that toe. It's crooked. I mean, it's just like, you look at, okay. I just, I mean, I, when I was thinking about Jesus washing the feet, and he, I got this picture in my head. I'm like, that is just kind of gross, right? And let's, they didn't have, I mean, they, let's, the disciples, they didn't go for a weekly pedicure. We're talking toenail fungus. We're talking warts we're talking bunions and hammer toes and all that messed up toenails i mean and jesus just bent down to wash the I mean, have you ever thought about that you're, you're never going to look at this passage the same again now and so that's why this is so important that their feet were clean they were sticking their feet in each other's faces and so in that culture, they paid as much attention to washing feet as we do to washing our hands. And according to, uh, to one commentator, William Barclay, he said if there was no host, if there was no hired servant or owner, uh, then the, the first person in the room was responsible for making the provisions to wash the feet. But not in this crowd. Why did that happen? Why didn't someone other than Jesus jump to the task Grab the basin, grab the towel. Well, it happened because the disciples had an attitude problem. 
they were more concerned about rights and about superiority, about who was better than they were about service. There's a couple of times in Scripture where we see that they are arguing about pride. They had this, they had this penchant, right? They had this, this thing where they would just constantly argue about who was the greatest. I'm, no, who's going to get to sit at Jesus' right hand? Or I'm greater than you, or, and I need to be first. And so Luke twenty two twenty four 24 tells us that even after the institution of the Lord's Supper, hearing that Jesus would lay down his life for, for, him, for them, they still argued about who was the greatest. It's, it's really then no wonder that no one volunteered for this. And, and here's what I want us to remember, okay? You will never serve with compassion if you are worried about your position of importance. You will never serve with compassion if you're constantly worried about your position, your level, about how important you are. But there was even one person that had a more evil attitude than pride, and, and we see, us, see in verse 2 it tells us that Judas had already decided to turn Jesus in. Now put yourself in, in, in Jesus' position here. He knew about their pride. He knew about their arguing. He even knew that Judas was about to betray him. Do you think he would be quick to wash the feet? I mean, here, this is when Jesus needed his disciples. This was his, his greatest trial. He's going from this room straight to the Garden of Gethsemane. It's there where he will be arrested, accused falsely, and then less than 24 hours nailed to the cross. And when Jesus needed the greatest comfort, he got nothing. I think most of us would have felt sorry for ourselves. We would have kind of thrown our, a fit, given the disciples a guilt trip. All right, we're good at giving guilt trips. Oh, so I guess nobody's going to wash our feet, you know. I mean, we would say something kind of passive-aggressive, and, and we would do something. But Jesus, instead of pouting, instead of getting mad, he just volunteered to do it. Why? I think Jesus' motivation was just simply compassion. It says that, right, in verse 1, having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. He had compassion for them. Jesus was more concerned for his disciples in this hour than he was concerned for himself. And so... You know, even though he was hurting, even though he knew what was about to come, even though he was facing death, he did this because of his great love for them. Do we love in that kind of way? Even when people are neglecting what they should be doing, do we still have compassion for them? Um, are we more concerned about others than ourselves? But Jesus also, he, he had compassion, but he also knew what his mission was. And in verse 3, it says, Jesus knew that his father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. He knew he was a man on a mission. He knew who he was. He knew what he was doing, and nothing was going to deter him from that mission, that he had come to save the world from their sins. And so when he knew what he was doing, I mean, you just kind of look at this. And then, kind of picture this, he got up from the table, all right? He took off his robe. This was kind of a, a, an undignified thing to do, but they had to take off their outer cloak so they wouldn't get it wet. So most people think Jesus at this point was bare-chested, right? He just had his robe wrapped around his waist, and, and without a shirt on, with a towel wrapped around him, he gets down on his hands and knees on the hard floor. He didn't have rubber gloves. He didn't have the mask. He didn't have the, uh, you know, I mean, this is just, just straight out, he bent down to serve the disciples. And he started pouring water into the basin. He began to wash the disciples' feet. But, right, you understand that there were 12 disciples. How many feet is that? 24. This is not just like he washed down and washed one person's foot and stood back up and gave an object lesson, right? This took some time. He went disciple by disciple by disciple. 
And what did he do when he got to Judas? Have you ever thought about that? What would you want to do? I mean, I would like leave Judas for the last, and when that water was just dingy, dirty, nasty, I mean, when it was like just the absolute worst, and you get to Judas to say, oops, and like kind of stand up and, and actually accidentally spill it on him and like dump it on his head. And I'm showing how much compassion I have. <laughs> Do you all think like that, though? I mean, but no, Jesus washed the feet of even Judas. Uh, and, and then, you know, he, the only reason he was doing that, he knew he had a mission. He, he had this compassion. He had this great love. And let me just ask you, how Christ-like is your compassion? How Christ-like is your compassion? You, you see, the world thinks that service is a matter of action. But Jesus says it's a matter of attitude. It's a matter of attitude. Uh, service starts right down in our heart. It, it, it starts when we have compassion for those around us. When we don't think ourselves as higher and better than the people who are around us. And that's why Jesus gives this an example. Um, Jerry Jones wrote in a book, Discipleship and, and God's Eternal Purpose. He says, as a true disciple of Jesus, do you see others as Jesus sees them? When you see large crowds at athletic contests, what do you see? If Jesus were watching the World Series or the Super Bowl, what do you believe his thoughts would be? Would his primary thought process be only on which team is ahead or how many innings or how much time is left? To ask these questions is to answer them. The heart of Jesus was so in tune with the Father that he could look on the crowds and have deep compassion for them, even when he was mistreated. Until we get... And until we can look on people with Christ-like compassion, we have not developed the sight of Jesus. And I would even say, until we look on people with Christ-like compassion, we cannot be Christ-like servants either. A servant, being a servant really starts with compassion. And, it, and, that, and we do that by seeing ourselves as we really are. Verse 16, we'll read in a few, few minutes, no servant is greater than the master. And so we are simply, right, we, we are sinners saved by grace. And so we're, we're, we're trying our best to live out our faith and, and share this love, share this joy we have found in Christ with the world around us. But we were all once sinners. We, Titus 3 talks about that, right? We were once sinners, but Christ saved us. Not because of what we have done, but because of what he did on the cross. So we need that Christ-like compassion. But we don't just need compassion. The second thing, we also need a Christ-like humility. That's the second point. We need a Christ-like humility. And so in verse 6, let's keep reading then the next section here. And we'll get to the truly, truly statement here in a minute. We're just kind of doing the background leading up to it. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing, you, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, you should never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. So Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. He's saying, just give me a whole bath. Jesus said to him, the one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but it's completely clean. And you are all clean, but not all, every one of you, for he knew who was to betray him, and that is why he said not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to him, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, here it is. I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. 
So the second thing we need to develop is, is a Christ-like humility. As Jesus went down and the line, that the disciples must have been shocked and, ha- and humiliated. I don't know if you've ever been part of any type of a foot washing service or, or, or seen it done, but the really the, the humbling part is for the person whose feet are being washed. When you're sitting there, that's a very humbling experience. Because you're like, I, you shouldn't be doing this. I should be washed. I mean, it's just it's a weird feeling, okay? And so you think about this, and that's kind of what Peter was experiencing. He's like, wait a minute, you shouldn't be washing my feet. But I think he was almost saying it not just out of humility, but also out of this guilt that, I, hey, I am the one that should be doing this. And, and, and But this, you know, it, there's also maybe a little hint of pride in Peter. It's like, I don't need your help. I, I don't, you know, and, and for some of us, we have this false sense of pride that I don't need to be served. I don't need someone to help me. That's why we don't stop and ask for directions. And that's why we refuse um, help. And, and, and so when we help others, you, you may be surprised that sometimes they will object that I don't need your charity. And, and what are you trying to do, make me look bad? So Peter, that's, he said, don't just wash my, you know, don't, not my feet, don't wash and and then Jesus told him, but if I don't do this, you don't even belong to me. And so that's when Peter replied, hey, just give me a bath. Just give me a just, just cover me up, cleanse me. And so when Jesus gets up, he puts his clothes back on. Verse 12, do you understand what I'm doing? Do, do, you, do you even know why I'm doing this? You call me teacher, you call me Lord, and that is right. Because it's true. And so Jesus is not saying this out of pride. He is making the statement, I am the Lord. We've already established in this series that Jesus made, there was no question about him establishing his divinity. He very clearly said, I am God. I am the Lord. And so this isn't pride. He didn't say, oh, shucks, fellas, I'm just, hey, I'm just kind of one of you. He stood up and said, I am the Lord, and because I am doing this, I am giving you an example to follow. I did this for a reason, all right? Um, and so he's telling us, he's giving this it's the example. I love what Max Lucado says. He says, the Lord of the universe, his first day was spent in a barn, and his last was spent down washing feet. I sometimes wonder, do we even realize how radically different Jesus is calling us to be from the world around us? When we became a Christian, he doesn't just save us from our sins. He wants us to save us from our worldly attitudes and desires and lifestyles. We're to be counter-cultural. The Bible makes it clear that God resists the proud, right? We see that over and over again. Pride is dangerous because we think that we've got everything under control. We don't need God's help. We don't need anyone's help. And Jesus says, though, wait a minute. I want you to deny yourself. I want you to take up your cross, and I want you to follow after me. See, the world looks for status, but Jesus looks for servants. The greatest leader the all-knowing, the all-powerful God, the God of heaven and earth, he modeled for us service. And when he finished doing that, his simple command to us, hey, guys, now you need to go and do the same thing. Verse 16, no servant is greater than his master. And there's a little bit of controversy here about that word servant. Um, Some translations will translate it slave. Some will translate it servant. Uh, The Greek word is doulos, and it's really more than just a servant. Uh, It's literally a bond slave. Uh, A bond slave or a bond servant wasn't someone who just served another once in a while. They were in bondage to this other person. They were in debt to this this other person. And so I doubt there's, there's not a person in this room that grew up saying, Man, when I grow up, I just want to be a a slave to someone else. It's not something we aspire to be. But when Jesus says this, he says, Now, 
This is the example I've left for you. This is how you should live. You should be a servant. You should be a slave, a bond slave, right? This is the kind of commitment he is calling us to. This is the kind of humility. Our pride keeps us from serving others. Our pride keeps us from having this idea of service as an aspiration in life. But Jesus asked us to go against all of our selfishness and, and to stand up and to go contrary to the world around us. And in fact, he would say, you, really, the, the best way to see what you believe is to watch and see how you act and act and see how you serve others. In Matthew uh, chapter 20, it says, You know that in this world kings are tyrants and officials lord it over the people beneath them, but among you it should be quite different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must become your slave. For even I, the Son of Man, came here not to be served, but to serve others and to give my life as a ransom for many. Um, he was humble enough to do the little things. He was, Jesus, he, was, he, he showed us what humility looks like. And we just need to find a need and we need to feel a need. That's what Jesus did. He didn't, he didn't look around and, 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 and f try to figure out who was the, in that position of bond servant or bond slave. He just said, okay, if you want to follow me, this is what your life looks like. Uh, the third thing that we need this morning, we need Christ-like service. We need Christ-like compassion. We need Christ-like humility. We need Christ-like service. I said just last week that uh, that gr service is the path to greatness. And I, and I believe that in this, in this life. The world desires happiness. Christ offers this blessing if you follow him. How many times have you heard people say, hey, my goal, I just want to be happy. That's my goal in life. I want to be happy. And you hear that when people get divorced. I, I deserve to be happy. You hear that when people leave a job. Hey, I deserve to be happy. You hear that when people go in debt to buy stuff they don't need with money they don't have. I deserve to be happy. And here Jesus is basically say, saying, when you look for others to make you happy, you won't be. But when you look for ways to make others happy, you'll be blessed. I read this little illustration, this story from a, from, um, from a writer, and he said, he, he told about this boy who was lounging around in, in the wintertime on the living room floor watching TV, and his dad came in from, from shoveling snow. He saw him there and said, son, in 24 hours, you won't hardly remember what you're watching. How about doing something that for the next 20, for the next 20 minutes that you'll remember for the next 20 years? I promise you that you will enjoy it every time you think of it. What is it? Well, well, son, there are several inches of snow over on old Mrs. Brown's walkway. Why don't you go see if you can shovel it off and get back home without her knowing who did it? He wrote, I did the walkway in about 15 minutes. She never knew who did the job, and Dad was absolutely right. It's been more than 20 years, and I've enjoyed the memory every time I thought about it. That's, that's compassion, that's humility, that's service, right? That, that's, that's the kind of attitude that Christ is calling us to have. And in verse 17, we read about this Christ-like service. Verse 17, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Again, when we think we need something, we just go out and buy it. Christ is saying, don't just buy it. Don't just talk about it. Don't just learn about it. Don't just have a Bible study about it. If you want to experience true blessing, true joy in life, go out and do it. I've shared before one of my favorite statements is blessings follow obedience. When we're obedient to Christ, you will experience blessing. And I'm not talking financial blessings. We turn this around, and we, that's, is that really humility if we do something expecting to get something in return? Is that really compassion if the only reason we serve is to get accolades and to, you know, to get recognition and 
to, to, to everybody say, hey, can you, did you see what he did? Uh, okay. Jennifer and I yesterday celebrated our 22nd wedding anniversary. So we've been married 22 years. And, yeah, it's good. And she's, she's awesome. Um, that's a long time anymore. Um, and, um, and we started dating six years before that. So kind of uh, it's been a while. Um, and, and I got thinking about when we first got married, okay, and I, 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 I'm getting better at this. I'm not perfect. When we first got married, I was really bad. You know, and, and husbands, some of y'all can relate. I'd go, you know, hey, honey, guess what I did? I just loaded the dishwasher. <laughs> Guys, can you relate? Hey, I did an entire load of laundry by myself. You should thank me for that. There's, I saw dishes on the countertop. Hey, Jenny, I washed all the dishes for you. I vacuumed the house. Well, maybe not that. But <laughs> I would, I was, she's laughing. At me. I mean, I would, I was like, okay, I did it. Hey, you know, aren't you proud of me? I'm getting better at this. Now, when I just see something that needs to be done, I just do it. And I don't like wave right. Hey, guess what I did? I leave a note. Leave a note. <laughs> No, now I just walk through the house and I see something that needs to be done. Say, kids, get in here. <laughs> the whole reason I had kids. All right? No, but, you know, as you get older, as you get a little more mature, hopefully as you learn a little bit more about humility, you realize you don't need the recognition. You don't have to stand up and say, I did it. Look at me. You can kind of stand back and say, you know what? It doesn't matter who gets credit for it doesn't matter if someone else even gets credit. We just serve. We just show compassion. We just show humility. And blessings will follow obedience. And, and the funny thing is, you know, once you start really being a servant, people will come to expect you to do it over and over again. And that's all right. Because what we see from Jesus right here, when he's, he didn't stop serving the disciples when he washed his, their feet, he kept serving them all the way to the cross. And now he says to us, take up your cross daily and follow after me. Jesus calls us to this radically different way of life. It's not an attitude of superiority, but of compassion. It's not a lifestyle looking for status, but for service. It's not pursuing worldly happiness, but it's finding the blessedness that comes from, from following Jesus, from obedience. That's greatness in, in the eyes of Jesus. And he says here, as since I am your Lord, I am your master, I am your teacher, I have washed your feet. You ought to wash each other's feet. I've given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. The final thing I want to say, what's our response? Well, it just starts with receiving Christ. It just starts with receiving Christ. Verse 18 through 20, we'll kind of finish up this passage. He says, I'm not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scriptures will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I'm telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly. Here's another statement. I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me. And whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. We can serve because we, we're a good person. There's a lot of good people who serve. That's not what gets you into heaven. You don't get into heaven because you did a lot of good stuff. You, 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 you get into heaven because you have received Christ as your Lord and Savior. Right? And he's saying here, receiving me is the same as receiving the one who sent me. In John chapter 1. And we, we studied this at the very start of this series, and several weeks back. He says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So this is the, this is the starting point for service. This is the starting point. Have you received Jesus? Is he your Lord? Is he your Savior? Last week, I, I was able to speak at the baccalaureate service for Galax, and I 
I was able to look at the graduates and tell them the most important decision you will ever make, it's not where you, will you go to school, who you will marry, what job to take, where to live. I mean, those are all big decisions. But the most important decision you will ever make is will you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's the most important decision in your entire life. And so we must receive Jesus as our, our Lord and Savior. What we see here, we've been talking about Jesus washing the disciples' feet, but when he talks about them being clean, he's talking not just about their feet, but he's talking about their heart. And so we see this picture throughout Scripture of how our hearts are cleansed by Jesus. Even you can go all the way back to the Old Testament, Psalm 51. This is after David was caught in sin with Bathsheba, okay? This is after he had Uriah killed. This is when David was confronted by the prophet Nathan about how all this bad stuff he has done. This was David's response. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. And this is what Jesus can do to us. 1 John 1. Verse, uh, I've read again, this is John later when he writes a letter and he says, we are, if we are living in the light as God is in the light, we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, it cleanses us from all sin. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just. Forgive us, forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all sin. Our wickedness. Hebrews, it says this, just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. So what we see, Jesus, he doesn't just want to wash our feet. He wants to wash our hearts. He wants to cleanse us from every sin, every bad thing, every disobedient thing we have ever done. And it starts when we receive him. I heard a quote twice this week. And and when you hear something several times in a week, I I can't help but think God's trying to, to get my attention with it. And I wanted to share it with you. It was a quote from Pastor Tim Keller up in New York. And he said, We are more wicked than we ever dared believe, but we are more loved and accepted in Christ than we ever dared hope. This is this is a picture of the gospel. We're more wicked wicked than we ever dared believe, but we are more loved and accepted in Christ than we ever have dared hope. So my invitation to you this morning, right? is that will you receive Christ? And I know not everyone will. There will be those who reject Christ. We can keep going in verse 21. There's one more truly, truly statement here. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, I truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. I mean, he's telling them, listen up, one of you. I mean, these are the disciples who had been with Jesus, and yet Judas betrayed Jesus. And so I want to just tell you as believers, there are times when you are sharing about Jesus to others, there will be people who reject you, who reject Christ. They're not rejecting you, they're rejecting Christ. And so we can't, we we, we simply cannot be discouraged from that. We just keep being faithful to what God has called us to do. And so my invitation to you this morning as we go into our response time is simply this. Will you receive Christ? And if you have received Christ, will you serve him with compassion and humility? Let's pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, thankful for your word. I'm thankful that you challenge us. You give us such a great example to follow. So, Lord, help us to be more Christ-like. Christ-like in our thoughts and our attitudes. Christ-like in our humility. Christ-like in our compassion. Christ-like in our service. Just help everything in our lives. to to look more and more like Jesus. It's a process of sanctification that as we grow in Christ, we are changed to become more like Christ. I pray for those in this room. I don't want to assume that every person in this room is a believer. So there may be someone in this room that, that needs Jesus as their Lord and Savior. My prayer is this morning that they would receive Jesus. Your word tells us, we just read it, if we confess our sins... You are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
So that's my prayer this morning. Would you just ask Jesus, would you just confess your sin? And would you receive Jesus to be your Lord and Savior? In Romans, it tells us if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that, God, you raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. So this morning, that's my prayer, that if there's anyone here that doesn't know Jesus, this morning would be the the most important decision of their life when they choose to receive you. And for the rest of us, Lord, my prayer is just, would you just give us compassion? Would you just give us eyes to see the world as you see it? Would the things that break your heart break our heart? And would we be moved not just to, to think about it, not just to pray about it, but to do something about it? Lord, we, uh, we thank you this morning. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.